Well, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm glad you're with me here on a Sunday. Uh, just a notification that next Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. So uh, a lot of people are going to be watching the game me included. So we're going to take a pass next Sunday and pick it up the following week. I hope you guys understand because um, it's going to be a busy week next week. Uh, if you missed it, the Mercedes-Benz EQS full video came out yesterday. This past Wednesday, we had the M240i, the BMW. What's coming up this week? On Tuesday, we're going to have a comparison between the Porsche Macan and the BMW X3. I think a lot of people will be interested in that. Uh, Wednesday, we're going to have a, another one of our top five lists. Top five mid-sized three-row SUVs, vehicles like the Highlander, that sort of thing. We're going to do our top five and some honorable mentions. Um, and then next Saturday, we're going to have the Hyundai Tucson Hybrid. Sorry, the Hyundai Tucson Plug-in Hybrid. The PHEV review will be next Saturday. This is actually Andrea's mom's car. She got it on Friday and uh, loves it. It's white, full load. So it's one of the first ones around here. So we're actually going to go and shoot with her car. A couple other things. Car Cost Canada. Don't forget to sign up if you are looking for a new car. Uh, use the promo code MOTORMOUTH. Become an expert member. It unlocks extra searches. If you're going to buy <clears throat> a new car, you want every advantage you can, especially in this market. So Car Cost Canada, what does that mean? Car Cost, you find out what the dealer's cost is for the car. Any special rebates, discounted interest rates, you name it. So that's there. And then CanadaDrives.ca is where you go for a used car. They have hundreds of used cars across the country. You order it online, you get your financing online, and then they deliver it to you in a uh, covered truck. Sometimes the same day and often the next day. All right. Now, I just want to... Um... Oh, we have some pictures and some other things to go through. All right. I want to apologize. Last week, there was a, an, an annoying clicking noise. I, I hit a, a setting on this program I use, and uh, something went sideways, so I apologize for that. Okay, let's get into a couple of pictures here. Uh, there we go. Uh, the first one is... This is from Alan from South Florida. It's a 2020 Corvette, the C8, and that's spectacular with the blue and the black. I like that. I would, I would like it with silver wheels, but I get the whole black and blue thing. So there you go. That's a pretty sweet ride. Do you know that customer satisfaction and reliability of the Corvette, the new Corvette, is through the roof, and resale value is through the roof? And he's got a 20, which means it's the very first year, and they didn't make that many of them. I'm hearing that clicking noise again. Are you guys hearing that? I apologize. And then this one is Rod with a CX-5. Uh, MX-5, I should say. He lives in the Thousand Islands in Ontario. And that is a great car. Not for um, the winter, but in the summer. So I apologize about this noise again. I'm hearing it, this pinging noise. And I'm not sure what that is. Hang on a second here. Uh, see, there's no way to check that until we actually go live. So I think it's every time someone makes a comment, it goes off. So I apologize about that. If you want to get a picture in, Zach at Motormouth.ca, Z-A-C-K at Motormouth.ca, Zach at Motormouth.ca. Okay, get that in. All right. Uh, we did have a question a couple of weeks ago from uh, James, who's a regular contributor here to the live show. And he was asking a question about the Mazda CX-30 and the fact that um, he's not getting any heat in the car. And I did get a reply from Mazda Canada, and they basically said they're aware of the issue. Hang on a second here. He said they're aware of the issue. On certain non-turbo models, there's been a reported issue with the fail-safe thermostat integrated into the coolant control valve. That sounds high tech, doesn't it? Which can result in the check engine light on and symptoms such as engine taking longer to warm up, 
engine temperature gauge fluctuating and poor heating performance. The issue isn't directly related to cold weather, but the symptoms or the lack of heat is certainly more noticeable in cold weather. There's been a service bulletin on the issue and dealers have a documented repair. So if it sounds like what your viewers are experiencing, they should definitely take the vehicle to a dealer and have it inspected. So there you go. Apparently Mazda knows that there's an issue with the, um, with the CX-30 and non-turbo four-cylinder engines. So that is something that uh, they are looking into. Okay. So I apologize about this clicking noise. Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look into that, where that's coming from. So we're just going to soldier on. I apologize for that. Um, okay. First question up is from Carter. Hey, Zach, do you foresee the current gen STI becoming a future classic? How about the new Z or Supra? I would say uh, anything that's available with a manual transmission will be a future classic. So the STI and the WRX would certainly be collectible in the long run because time is not on the, on the side of manual transmissions. It's going to go away. And that's something that um, people who like manuals will always want to have. Now for the Supra, I don't know about that because it's really just a, a reskinned and rebadged um, BMW, all BMW drivetrain. Even the interior looks like a BMW, so I'm not so sure about that one. Anything that's unique and special, especially when it comes to like a manual transmission, so I would say the STI for sure. Uh, hey Zach, just watched the EQS review. Can you expound more on your driving impressions? How did you like the ride quality and the way it handled? Will you, would you take an EQS over an S-Class? In fact, yes, I would take the EQS over the S-Class. Um, if you go back and watch our S-Class video, we liked the car. I didn't love the interior. I think the EQS interior with the big uh, hyper screen thing is pretty spectacular to look at. Um, but that's something that um, you actually have to like. The ride, it makes a, a pure luxury car even more luxurious because it's so smooth and quiet because it's electrified. It always has traditional luxury. It's always got that sort of floaty ride. Didn't love the brakes. The brakes were kind of a bit too mushy for our taste. You would get used to them if you dro drove it every single day. And back to the video again, the active rear steering is really quite remarkable. Um, so I would... I per if you know if you're into buying an electric car and you're into buying a full-size luxury sedan that would be a wonderful car to drive every day it is pure mercedes-benz and pure luxury and pure isolated from the outside world so all of that mercedes knows how to do both in the s-class and the eqs but the electrification sort of takes it to the next level Can you make a 2022 Cadillac Escalade ESV uh, premium luxury? And Zach, what's your favorite car sedan versus uh, SUV 2022? So uh, we've already done a video on the Escalade, but not the long wheelbase one. So I'm sh not sure if we're going to have access to that that larger vehicle. Um, so when you get asked questions like, what's your favorite car SUV? It all comes down to what category, what price? Like small cars, I've got favorites. Large cars, I've got favorites. Premium cars, non-premium cars. So that's a very wide open sort of question. Hey, Zach, saw your EQS review. Between the EQS and the base Porsche Taycan, which would you take and why? Thanks. Um, as much as I love the Taycan for what it is, because it's a Porsche and all of that, I'm, I don't love the size of it. It's a bit too small, especially the back seat. Um, so... I, I appreciate the Taycan, but to me, it doesn't speak. Like, every time I drive one and I give it back, I don't go, oh, geez, I'm really going to miss this car. Just not not the way I feel about it. So I would rather have a Panamera GTS over a Taycan. Will you, re re uh, will you be reviewing the Hyundai Tucson PHEV? Did your mother-in-law ever get hers? As I mentioned, if you just tuned in, it arrived on Friday. We're going to shoot it this week, and we will definitely be having the video. It comes out next Saturday. Uh, I went to the Mercedes-Benz dealership to look uh, at a lease for an A220. They quoted me $900 a month and seems to be the same price at other Mercedes-Benz dealers. How can they come up with this? Thanks. Um, an A220. Well, um, you've got to remember the one thing about a lease is what they're doing is they're trying to guess what the residual value will be after four years. So if, if they think the trend is towards SUVs and not towards 
like an A-class sedan, um, then what they do is they hedge their bets and they put a lower residual value on it, which means you pay more every month. So that's probably what they do. We'll pick a round number. So say the car is $50,000 and they think after four years, it's going to be worth twenty five. dollars So you've got to pay $25,000 over the four years. If the car had a higher residual value, say $30,000, you would only be paying um, the difference, the $20,000. So that's kind of how it works. So what I suggest you do is look at other products and see if you can get something that's a, a better deal, maybe like a, an Audi A3 is another nice car in that same kind of category and class. But it's basically because obviously Mercedes has put a low residual value on it. Does diesel fuel have small iced parts in cold climates causing the engine to cough? Um, okay, I think what you might be noticing in very cold climates is diesel fuel actually becomes very thick um, and sticky. And sometimes they, some vehicles actually have a heated line heats up uh, the fuel pump and the and the fuel line because when it's really really cold you've got to get the the fluid moving so i'm not sure about what you mean by um iced parts sometimes small ice parts in cold climates yeah so it depends on the vehicle you're talking about some of them do have heating elements for the vehicle to warm it up all right i just want to check something So what's what's going on with the sound here? Is it is it tolerable, guys? I apologize about the clicking noise. Not sure what that is. I got to do more digging into that. I thought I, I thought I fixed it, but obviously I hadn't. <clears throat> Hi Zach, my friend keeps referring to Lexus as a second-hand luxury car. It's inferior to uh, BMW, Benz, Infiniti, and Acura. It drives me mad. How would you respond to that? I told him. Only, I told him only he says this, is a second-hand luxury car. Well, I think it's basically, um, you know, they're obviously not a fan of the brand. Um, so maybe all you say to them is, yeah, you might consider it a second-hand luxury car, but it's the best second-hand car you can buy because the reliability is so good. So if you were going to buy a second-hand luxury car, that's the one you would choose if you wanted it to start and run every day. So I would just say, you know, uh, he's talking out his ass. That's basically what I would say. Because, you know, Lexus is luxury. It's premium. Is it in the same conversation as other pure luxury brands? No. But, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly a luxury brand. For sure it is. Thanks for hosting another session. You are welcome. <laughs> Wife says she wants to see Andrea's mom on the show. I'm not sure uh, Monica would go for that. Uh, maybe we'll get a picture of her with her new car and her husband, Phil. What are the pros and cons of having a white car versus a black one? Interesting you should mention this, Sam, because just before I came on here to do the live show, I just finished washing our white car. We have a white Porsche Cayenne, and I did kind of a early spring cleaning on it pulled out all the mats, vacuumed the carpets, cleaned the whole inside, washed it on the outside, did the wheels. It looks like a new penny. Um, the one thing I'll say about a white car is they do tend to look cleaner a little bit longer versus a black car. Um, they're great in the summer because they don't absorb heat like a black car. A black car on a hot summer day is hot. Um, so those are a couple of benefits, I would say. You have to like it. I mean, the thing about color is it's a very personal thing. I never liked white cars until we, we got this one. And we got this one because it was the car that was available. and had nothing to do with the vehicle. It, it had everything to do with the vehicle and nothing to do with the color. We were offered the car and if either we were going to get it or we weren't. And it was the only one available. So we took it. What's your favorite non-luxury SUVs? 
back to my point earlier, you need to be a little bit more specific. You're talking about midsize SUVs, small SUVs, compact SUVs. By the way, on Wednesday, we're dropping another one of our top five lists that we do. Uh, we did them over the holidays. We're going to do our top five midsize three row SUVs. These are all non luxury. So it won't be Q7s and things like that. It'll be vehicles like um, the Highlander and uh, the uh, Telluride, that sort of stuff. Here's Josh back watching live, been following the replays for a while. Uh, Josh got a Tesla Model Y about a month or so ago. It would be nice, Josh, if you uh, let us know how that's going. Oh, by the way, we haven't had a super chat yet, I don't believe. Let me just check here. If you want to do a super chat, you can um, for sure get your questions answered. Also, we'll be bringing back your Friday segment on collectible cars from Core Motor Cars. I just recorded one yesterday. It's a 1967 uh, Camaro convertible. First year for the Camaro. It's a resto mod. I filmed it yesterday. It'll be going out Friday. I'm gonna well, a couple of reasons uh, that we took a bit of a break. The, in the winter, it's really tough to shoot the cars we have to shoot during the week, and also get time to go and shoot a car. Um, for the Friday segment because the weather is so crappy in the winter we have to when it's a sunny day or a nice day shoot the reviews okay that Andrea and I do often there's not an extra nice day for me to go over and grab a car from core but uh, there as the weather gets better we'll start to do more and there's one coming back on Friday Uh, hi, Zach. Will you be back on Motoring TV this season? No, my run on Motoring TV has come to an end. Good evening. I really enjoy this. Well, thank you very much. That's a good-looking Corvette. Sure was. That was a beautiful car. I'm hearing the click noise. I don't know what that is. I've got to figure out what the hell the click noise is. So anyway, we're going we're gonna to keep pushing through. Hopefully, it's not too, too bad for you. Uh, Ricardo, dear Zach. What's the difference between a premium brand and a luxury one? Greetings from Lima, Peru. So I would suggest that a premium brand is is like Acura, okay, um, and Infinity. And to the earlier point about Lexus, maybe Lexus. This it's sort of like you have your mainline cars, then you have premium, and then you have luxury. And luxury cars typically are the German import brands. Those are typically luxury cars, Mercedes-Benz, Audi, and so on. A lot of times it comes down to price point. So a premium car like an Acura is not nearly as expensive as like a Mercedes equivalent of the same car. So that's kind of how I look at it. So you have your mainline cars like Nissan, then you have Infiniti, which is just above it, and then you have you know real luxury, and then pure luxury would be like Bentley and that sort of thing. So that's kind of how it goes. Zach, what's your opinion of the 17 to 20 Maserati Levante? I've seen any reviews on your channel. Does it compare to the uh, Cayenne? I haven't driven one. And Maserati do not make the cars available us for us to drive. It's such a small market share for that brand. So, yeah, if they offered us one, yeah. But I um, uh, apologize, haven't driven it. Looking for cars like the Sentra Forte Elantra or Elantra and Corolla. The Forte is my favorite. Uh, but every time I think about I feel I should get the Corolla because of reliability, what are your thoughts? Okay, yeah, I would I would agree with you that I mean the Corolla is the kind of the gold standard when it comes to reliability. Civic, the non-turbo version of the Civic is very reliable. Uh, one car I want you to try, and you list you listed it there, it's kind of like I've really come to become fond of it is the newly refreshed Sentra that came out two years ago, roughly two years ago. Um, I just think there's a lot of value in that car. So if you get a Forte and you get an Elantra, they have um, a solid rear axle or a torsion beam rear suspension. Not saying that's bad, but other cars in that class have independent rear suspension. Corolla, Mazda, uh, the Civic, as we mentioned, but also Sentra has gone to an independent rear suspension. And it makes that little car a lot of fun to drive. I like the interior, but I really like the value. So go and check that one out. Um, 
but yeah, if you're just worried, if 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 reliability is your overarching concern, go to the bank of Toyota and get a Corolla or get a Civic non-turbo, so the two-liter engine. We have one. We have a Civic two-liter. Great car. Every time I drive it, I go, what a great little car. <clears throat> What's the best CUV on the market? Well, Joe, we did go on the channel and we did just over the holidays our top five compact SUVs. They're all listed there. Is not having 360 camera or blind spot assist a deal breaker? No. Have you been driving without it all these years? Probably. All right, can you can you get through the day without it? Absolutely. So reversing cameras now are mandatory. So every car is going to have a reversing camera for safety. The 360 camera, you don't you don't need to have that. And blind spot assist, you don't have to have that either. You've been driving many years without it. So is it a deal breaker? I would say no. I really like the Bolt EUV, and I think it would be great for my family of four, but I, I'm very worried about batteries exploding. Should I stay away or buy because they did fix the battery problem, right? Okay, yes. So, Stephen, what's happened is, um, and somebody actually mentioned this about the Bolt earlier, asking about their, their car getting fixed. And, and part of the problem was the terminology that General Motors used about the fixed. And they said they were going to replace all of the electric. What was what was the terminology? Um, it wasn't the battery pack. They called it some some other terminology. And I was confused. I thought it was the battery control module. But what they actually meant in their in their terminology, they didn't say battery pack. Was they actually replaced the battery in all these older cars? My massage therapist has a bolt the first year, and she was contacted. Uh, she dropped it off at 8 in the morning, picked it up at 4 in the afternoon with a brand new battery with better range. Bob's your uncle. Uh, she loves her car. She says it's one of the best cars she's ever owned. Here's what I want you to remember. How many of these bolts do you think actually caught? They didn't explode. Some of them caught on fire. There was 12 cars out of the arguably hundreds of thousands of bolts that they've made. So 12 cars total. That's it. Um... And all of the new ones will have the new battery technology and all the older ones are going to be retrofitted. So I'm a big fan of the Bolt. I think it offers loads of value for the price. Um, and I, yeah, I have no problem recommending it. I think it would be totally fine. I just placed an order for, uh, I guess you're thinking Subaru Crosstrek Outdoor 2022. I don't know. What's your opinion of the Audi Q3? Big fan of the Q3. I think the vehicle offers loads of value in that sort of premium luxury space. The one thing I love about it is it runs on regular gas. And we've seen the high gas prices uh, around the world. Uh, oil is going to be flirting with $100 a barrel here very soon. So... Any break you can get on not paying for premium gas. <clears throat> so I'm a big fan of it. What it doesn't have is it ha it doesn't have a very um, firm steering feel. It's really quite lightly. The steering feel is very light. So go and try it out. But I think the product overall is fantastic. <coughs> <coughs> Elvis Jacob. Elvis is in the house. Hey, Zach. Does the Macan S handle better than the BMW X3? I would argue yes. Now, unless you, we have them right next to each other to do the, on the exact same roads, um, we're going basically by seat of the pants and memory. The Macan is a bit lower. And I think that, you know, if you're really pushing it, I would put my money on the Porsche for better handling. But for everyday drivability, depending on which trim you get, especially if you're getting the six-cylinder variants, they're both going to be excellent handling cars loads of power and um nicely finished so that's that's my thought on that <clears throat> our first super chat has just come in thanks for the research zach cheers yeah that was james with his uh, cold mazda problem excuse me i got a little tickle in my throat <coughs> <coughs> here's one 
Thank you for the quality content. Very much appreciated. Well, thank you for the super chat. That is very nice of you. Okay, we got 300 uh, plus on board and 96 thumbs up. And um, if you guys can cra smash the thumbs up, that would be great. <clears throat> Let me get back to where I was. Uh, people are... Re okay. When will re you review the Hyundai Ionic 5? The Ionic 5, there is already a video on the channel of the Ionic 5. So just go on to the search bar, type in motor mouth, Ionic 5. There's already a video. Andrew and I went to California in December for the um, North American launch. So that video is out. We did get the Ionic 5 back um, about a month ago and uh, we were just trying to spread them out. So if you're wondering about that video and when it's gonna drop, it's gonna be a few more weeks. We didn't wanna put both videos out. So the first one was our initial thoughts. The second one is living with it for a week. So that will be coming, but it, we're gonna wait. It's probably gonna be a few more weeks before that comes out. <clears throat> We have another super chat. This one's from David. When will car prices to settle down? Just bought my first Porsche. Awesome. Good for you. Uh, looks like a 2986 Boxster S. Six speed. Love it. Also ordered a new Q3. Thanks for your reviews. Well, that is a nice garage. That's a really good combination of having a Boxster S, manual transmission, flat six cylinder, fantastic car. Absolutely great. And a Q3, another great choice. When will car prices settle down? Not until the chip shortage uh, is rectified, and there's it's getting better. But there's still the the light at the end of the tunnel is still quite a far away. All of these car brands have to repopulate dealerships' lots, fulfill all the orders of people who are waiting for cars, replenish rental fleets, and so on. Plus, we're in this inflationary period worldwide with supply shortages, with all kinds of COVID money slushing around, jacking the prices of things up from governments spending billions, of, tens of billions of dollars around the world. So I think we're, you know, a lot of economists have been saying that this inflation that we're experiencing right now is what they call transitory, meaning it's just moving through but it's becoming stubbornly transitory now. It's getting to the point where it might actually be here. We might actually have inflation. And that's when banks are gonna to have to step in with interest rates. Well, we're gonna to have to wait and see what happens with that. But I don't think we're gonna see any relief for car prices, used car prices for quite a while. One of my favorites, Charlottetown Spud, great handle. With the chip shortage, are there a bunch of new cars already built waiting for chips or has manufacturing just stopped? So they don't make cars and, and leave them on the side of the factory. There are certain instances, Ford has done that uh, with some F-150s and General Motors has done that with some trucks where they can easily put a chip in for something. Usually uh, car production is throttled back. So what we're seeing is the car companies are still producing cars, but they're producing limited SKUs, meaning with all the variants are not available. And you'll see that if you go onto the online configurator, you'll see, okay, I like this model, but I want to order this. Well, it's not available at this time. So we're hearing stories of BMWs being delivered with uh, no touchscreen. So that's being removed. Other vehicles with no wireless charger. Other vehicles with no tilt and telescopic steering and on and on and on. So um, they're still producing cars. They're just producing cars with less available features. Another example is uh, the Grand Cherokee L, the long wheelbase one. The one we got was an early production model that was used for promotional purposes. So it was fully loaded. It had air suspension. If you go online now to Stellantis and you try and order a Jeep with the air suspension, it's not available. So they're giving you a credit for that. But that's that's what car companies are doing to get around it. <clears throat> Here's Jeff Fraser with another super chat. So I appreciate the super chats. Very nice of you. Maybe if I have enough super chats, I'll be able to get a new laptop because this one uh, melted down a little while ago. Good evening, Zach. I'm ordering a 2022 Venza Friday. It has zero incentives on Car Cost Canada. Can you offer any other advice not to get gouged? They say six months if I order white 
um, let me just, that jumped off here. If I order uh, white or longer time frame. Okay, um, unfortunately, it is a seller's market. It is not a buyer's market. You would be well advised to give a fully refundable deposit, meaning you say, I'm interested in buying a Venza, if you want the white one, and you give them a fully refundable deposit. You say, here's $1,000 that's fully refundable. And here's the reason why. They say, oh, well, it has to be a, a non-refundable. But you say, no, because when the Venza comes in, if you change your mind and you don't want it, they'll have no problem selling it to somebody else. So what you want to do is mitigate any future cost rises. So the prices of vehicles are going to start creeping up because of this inflation we're in. So if you can lock in this price now, a 2022 price, and then wait for your car to come, then you, uh, if they put the price up, you've already got a contract at the, at the price today. Then you want to get into things like you don't want to be paying extra for things like Scotch Guard or undercoating or any of that nonsense. You can do all of that stuff away from the dealer. So basically the way I like to buy cars is you pay for the car, you pay the tax and you drive it away. Not all the extras that dealers try to upsell you on, but really they're in, in the driver's seat, pun intended, and you are not. So if you're going to buy a car in this market, you're going to have to pay. My advice is, is, is your car that you're currently driving that bad that you can't just keep driving it? Because anything that's happening in the market right now, you do not have the upper hand. The car dealers have the upper hand. Here's John with a super chat. Hey, Zach, I ordered my iX50, but not hearing great things about BMW's charging network. Do you have any info on the iX and their network? I don't believe that BMW has a charging network. You're just using the non-supercharger, the non-Tesla um, charging network. So you've got Electrify Canada, Electrify America, you've got ChargePoint, you've got other independent charging. General Motors is going to be making a lot of chargers over the next couple of years. They've gone in big time with a charging network. They want to rival Tesla's charging network. And the good thing is that is going to be public and available to everybody. So that is going to be built over the next couple of years. But the one thing I'll say about electric car is everybody gets so hung up on this charging network. Most places you're going to go, you're going to be able to find a charger, okay? It, it might not be the fastest charger, but you're going to be able to find charging. Most people, when you drive an electric car, you charge at home. So you wake up every morning with a quote-unquote full tank, and you're going to drive it, and this really only comes into play when you're doing a long road trip. Now, most people, other than people who are maybe in sales or that sort of thing, don't go on long road trips very often, once a year, twice a year. Now, I'm sure if you're buying an iX from BMW, it's probably not your only car. So if you're going to go on a long, you know, a thousand kilometer or 600 mile road trip and you don't want to deal with that charging headache, you take the other car. Um, so most of your commuting is going to be charged from your house. And you only ever have to uh, use the charging networks when you leave your um, home and go somewhere where you have to charge it. So that's the one thing I, I always get sort of like people get so bent out of shape about the charging infrastructure. The charging infrastructure is your house. That's the best charging infrastructure you're going to have. And if that's what you're using most of the time driving around the city in your own city, it'll be more than enough. Here's a super chat from my T-Bird. Thank you. No question. Just a nice uh, uh, tip, I'll call it, for the channel. So appreciate that. So if you just have to, have to, have to get a question answered, you can do the super chat angle. Not saying you have to, but you can just wait your turn on the rest like everyone else. Um, Hey, Zach, did you see the news story about the 50K markup adjustment on the Mercedes EQS in a California dealership? Well, this is an American phenomenon. In Canada, it is uh, not allowed to do um, uh, markups over MSRP. This is happening in the United States. And all I can say about that is if you're stupid enough to spend $50,000 over MSRP, that's on you, right? People spending like thirty, forty thousand dollars over MSRP to get a Bronco, like give your head a scratch. Go to the Ford dealer, order one and wait for it to show up. 
but some people have more money than brains and they're impatient and they want to flex with having the newest and the latest. And obviously someone that's buying an EQS is rich, like kind of really rich. So what do they care? So um, I just don't get that whole buying an over MSR just so you can have it today. Order the car, wait for it to come in. Um, but that's not allowed in Canada. What Canadian dealers do though, is they'll put on a roof rack and they'll say they gave the car ceramic coating and they'll upcharge all of those features. They'll put on maybe a different set of wheels and then they sell the car for $10,000 over its MSRP. Um, they try to justify that price by the features they put on the car. But that sort of stuff is not allowed here in the US it is. My advice is if you're gonna order a car, order it and wait for it to come in. <clears throat> Are the new Hyundai and Kia hybrids and PHEVs with a 1.6 turbo okay for power? Or is the 2.5 turbo with the 8-speed wet dual clutch a better choice? Well, if you're all about just power, the 2.5 liter turbo with the 8-speed dual clutch, nice. A nice, nice, nice uh, power, uh, not power plant uh, for sure. That is going to be the performance model. But if you're into a hybrid, you're not into it for performance. You're, in for it, you're into it for a balance of driving dynamics and fuel economy, right? But the nice thing about the Hyundai Kia hybrid is it uses a conventional six-speed automatic. There's no CVT. It's a six-speed. So it gives you more of a conventional driving feel. The nice thing about hybrids and PHEVs is they give you that initial kind of launch torque because you're using electric motor. <coughs> and we all know that electric motors have instantaneous torque. So it makes off-the-line driving satisfying and that surge of torque is satisfying but if you're looking for the most dynamic fun to drive it would be the turbo <clears throat> hey zach if you're interested in a bz4x or Solterra, which would you choose does bank of toyota or subaru symmetry all-wheel drive going to be that different between the two <coughs> i think they're probably going to be mechanically identical i don't know i haven't done the deep dive on this and because all of the specifications have not been uh, shown yet for this. I was talking to the PR um, rep for Toyota Canada about this car and there is going to be a ride and drive event coming up this spring, late spring, just before summer. So all we know is the basics of the car, <clears throat> the basics of the range. They haven't divulged the um, all-wheel drive range and all of the specifics about the car. So we really don't know. My guess is it's going to be the same product with a different skin on it. Ricardo's saying, give uh, your host, give some likes to our host, Zach Spencer. Yeah, we've got almost 400 people on board. 155 thumbs up. There you go. Hi, Zach. Thanks for your content. I'm loving it. What SUV would you buy? Lease with a fifty to fifty-five thousand dollar budget. MB market, MB Mercedes Benz market. Um, if listen, a couple of pointers for if you're going to ask questions, try and be a little bit more specific. Like, give me some examples of what you're looking at in the fifty to fifty thousand range. Is this a, a compact SUV, a subcompact SUV, a midsize SUV? I don't know what you're looking at. So please, a little more uh, specific specificity. Is that even a word? Mike is saying there's no clicking on his end. I don't know what's going on. Did you ever drive the F-Pace SUV Jaguar in the winter? Yes, I did. I haven't driven an F-Pace in a long time. Uh, that thing was hot when it first came out, and it's really just fallen off. Jag sales are in the, in the crapper. Uh, to the point where Jag might not even be around for long. But yeah, it's going to be fine in the winter. But number one thing is um, that we that you use good winter tires. That's the number one thing. I have a family of four and our 2010 is done. What would be a good car next? I have two 13-year-olds. Same thing. I need more specifics. Are you looking for a compact car, a mid-sized car? You know, I am not a mind reader. 
Hi, Zach. I'm considering the... Here's a, here's a good question. I'm considering the Kia Seltos S, SX Turbo and the Ford Bronco uh, Big Bend. Any advice? We'll be going hunting and fishing occasionally, mostly dirt roads or gravel roads. The only thing that you didn't include in this, very well put together question, by the way, is this the Ford Bronco Sport or the Ford Bronco? I'm guessing it's the Bronco Sport. If you're, if you're considering cross-shopping it with the Seltos... Big fan of the Bronco Sport, by the way. Really enjoyed it. Um, fantastic suspension, especially on the um, uh, the Outer Banks. Uh, when you get the Outer Banks and the Big Band. I think the Big Band also gets the Haas suspension. So the one I like is the 2-liter turbo, right? So that's 250 horsepower. I wouldn't be running out and getting the 1.5-liter turbo, the 3-cylinder. So the 2-liter turbo, quite a, quite a performer. Really enjoyed the Bronco Sport. Great suspension. If you're going hunting, back roading in it, that's the one you want. When will the 2023 Kia Hybrid Sportage be available in the U.S.? We still have to wait for it to be released. It's going to be any time. It's going to be this spring. Hey, Zach, did they cancel the RS3 for Canada? No. RS3 is going to be coming. I know this because a couple of colleagues of mine went to drive the RS3 in Athens. They drove it um, in Greece about two months ago. So uh, Audi Canada wouldn't be taking people to drive the car in Greece if it wasn't coming to Canada. So RS3 is coming in sedan form only. I like the Ionic 5, but it's too expensive. I wish they could bring a cheap EV from Europe like the ID3. It's interesting, you know, I, um, my, my colleague David Booth, who writes for driving.ca in the National Post, um, did a great column about two or three weeks ago. You can look it up. Uh, David Booth, pretty easy to look up. Um, and <clears throat> he talked about how EV sales in Europe are way farther ahead than they are here in North America. And it came down to the fact that they have inexpensive EVs to buy. To your point, the Ionic 5 is too expensive. The only car, in my opinion, that offers any kind of value in the EV space is the Bolt. So I'll use Canadian dollars because this is where I live. It's $38,000 for a Bolt in Canada. The federal government's going to knock five grand off that, okay? So now you're at a $33,000 car with 400 kilometers of range, a useful size, and actually a great car and fun to drive. Then you add in any provincial rebates or, or state or whatever you get where you live, and it turns into a compelling package. For example, where I live here in Vancouver, if I were to buy a Bolt at $38,000, I get $8,000 back in rebates. That's now a $30,000 full electric car. There's some value there. What they have in Europe is they have the ID3. They've got uh, loads of uh, other brands we don't get here, like Renault and Peugeot that have electrified cars. Uh, so the ID3 is one of the bigger ones. The other one is the full electric Volkswagen Up. So you have Golf. Then smaller than Golf is Polo. Then smaller than Polo is a car called Up. It's a fun, cute little car available as a full electric but cheap right and so that's what's selling i think we could have a renaissance of small fun hatchbacks again cars like the size of the toyota yaris or the honda fit if they were full electric and they weren't expensive if they were twenty five thousand dollars and you could come with a little hatchback run around car with reasonable price and reasonable range I think that would sell. So Mary Barra, the uh, chairwoman of General Motors, has been talking this up about what they're going to be doing. So they have their Silverado EV that's coming. They have the Hummer EV. They have the Bolt. Is We're going to see if it goes back into production this month. In addition to that, they've also announced the um, Chevrolet Equinox compact crossover is going to be coming next year, starting at $30,000 in the United States. And they've also announced there's going to be a smaller crossover vehicle, even less expensive. Now we're talking. And we need more of this from other brands. All of the high-end luxury uh, or all of the high-end EVs are appealing to people who could buy these cars anyway, to be honest with you. What we need are meat and potatoes, basic cars that are fully electrified. If we're going to have this, if we're going to have the needle move in a big way, it is moving in a big way in Europe. It's also a function of the price of fuel. 
in my market here, fuel is very expensive. Uh, in Vancouver, um, the price of fuel here is $1.75 a liter. I don't even know what that is in, in, in gallons in the U.S., but it's like almost $6 a gallon. So people are motivated to buy an electric car. So that's what's happening. If you bring in the cheap little uh, hatchback cars, we might actually get people excited about hatchbacks again. Hi, Zach. Another super chat. Thank you for this. Thoughts on the Rivian pickup truck, dealer network, any long-term reliability concern to you since it's a new company? Listen, it's all on the table. We have to wait and see and get our hands on one. Um, yeah, dealer network's an issue. You know, you would hope with electric car, there's not going to be that much to go wrong with it. And the technology isn't really proving to be that reliable because a lot of car companies are putting too much technology in their cars back to the point i made a moment ago i would love to have an inexpensive run around electric car i don't need a hundred thousand dollar fancy pickup truck i don't i uh, you know and plus all of the in dash tech and all of the stuff and the autonomous features i wish car companies would just come come out with something that's um going to be simple and and easy to buy so your question on rivian i don't know I, i've yet to even see one on the road here so we'll have to wait and see if they're going to be reliable and of course any new vehicle new technology there's going to be warts right things are going to go wrong you're hearing the stories in the last week of tesla's doing emergency braking at higher speeds on the highway so that's the uh, obviously the autonomous system thinking that sees something and jamming the brakes on not fun, right? But you don't hear that spread around by the Tesla fanboys. They go, oh, probably operator error. Error. <clears throat> What's more annoying, the clicking noise or a CVT? Good point. I apologize again. My bad. i got to figure this out. I don't know where it's coming from, the clicking. With the current chip part shortage and with many car manufacturers substituting parts just to get the car out the door, do you think there is a whole generation of COVID cars faced with issues? Well, what I, I kind of agree with you to a certain degree. I wonder what's going to happen with vehicles in the years to come in the used market. Are these COVID cars not going to be as desirable? Are people going to say, uh, you don't want a BMW sold between here and here because there's no touchscreen or there's no wireless charger? I don't know. But, you know, there's such a shortage of vehicles right now. I think people don't care. Um, but, yeah, we're going to have to wait and see. I think it might have some effect. Depends on what how, or how serious the COVID car is, like what's really missing on it. Any word on the Nissan Aria EV? Will you be testing it and when available? Um, they just announced reservations this past week for the Aria and the new Z car, their Z car. <coughs> um, so that means the release is imminent. I haven't had any contact with Nissan uh, specifically about what the, the timeline is, but... From all indications, it'll be this spring. <clears throat> uh, this is Raj. I'm shocked at the amount of full electric cars being manufactured by all manufacturers. What brand do you think makes the best electric car? Well, the best electric car comes down to, in my opinion, price. You know, making an EQS at $150,000, well, that's easy. Right? You can throw everything in it. Back to my point a moment ago. I'd like to see some cheap and cheerful electric cars. <clears throat> uh, Jude, Mazda CX-5 or 2020 Lexus NX. Excellent timing because yesterday I just picked up the brand new Mazda CX-5. The signature trim, the top trim. Andrea and I went out this afternoon, beautiful sunny day here, and took some pictures of her with the car. <coughs> I would say I would say the Mazda, in my opinion. I like the NX. Andrea liked it more than I did. I thought it was okay. Uh, I, I would say considering the price, the NX, is the price is really too expensive. I would say the CX-5, especially if you can afford the turbo, is a hell of a car. But we've got the car this week. We're going to do another video on it. And by the way... 
We also got confirmation that the CX-50, um, we're going to get a chance to drive that in the middle of March. So there'll be a video at the end of March is when the embargo lifts on that. <clears throat> Raj is following up on his question about electric cars. Just for the record, I'm an internal combustion engine for life. Well, I'm not sure I'm an internal combustion engine for life guy. I'm, 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 as you probably gather from watching me doing these live shows, I'm quite pragmatic when it comes to uh, buy, like for the for for mass adoption of these things. We're going to have to get to the point where these are uh, accessible to a lot of people, not only accessible to the people that can afford, um, you know, high end vehicle. But to your point about being internal combustion engine for life, I picked up um, and went out for a drive today in uh, my Porsche Cayenne GTS with a manual transmission. Absolutely stunning day today here. Um, clear blue sky perfect temperature it's plus 10 degrees celsius today the flowers are coming up on my front lawn um so pretty happy about that took the car out for a drive and man the sound of that thing running it through the gears what are you gonna do well you can't get better than that jim is asking how much bigger inside is the vents into the rav4 say legroom fold down the seats and sleep in it um, I think you could fold down the seats and sleep in it. They, we we did do a comparison um, of the Rav4 and the Venza, okay, on the channel. So just type in motor mouth in the search bar, and then Venza and all of the videos. I think there's just two videos we've done, our full review on it, and then a, a comparison. So uh, that's all in there. So if you're really interested between the two, go and check it out. <clears throat> um. Bought a used 18 Nissan Qashqai back in October last year. I've been having so many issues since I bought it. Do you know of any problems with the Qashqai? Um, I like the product as it stands. Like I like the packaging of it. And you obviously did too. I like the size of it. I think it offers a lot of nice features. You know, these have not been without their issues though. Um, I think that you're better served to go online and do a search for uh, other owners of the cash guy to find out i'd be curious to know what the issues are i would hazard hazard a guess maybe transmission issues with a continuously var variable transmission that might be a weakness of the car i don't know specifically about that one i just know that cash guy the uh, cash guy has not had the greatest reliability but i but i still like the product because i like the packaging of it um, so you've got a three-year-old car, four-year-old car now. Uh, so do a little bit more research online for other owners. You could type in Kashkai web forum or even Facebook groups. There's a lot of Facebook groups. This is one thing that I found because I'm now a member of Facebook groups. So if you go into Facebook and you write in, uh, type in Kashkai, there's a search bar there. You might find a, a, a Facebook group of other Kashkai owners and you can ask questions to those people. Here's Yale from just up the road. Happy Sunday, Zach. Were you out cruising in gold member today? It looked mint. Yeah, that was me. He saw me spot. Hey, listen, Yale, that was before I washed it. So I before before I came on to do the live show, I washed both our Cayennes, the white one and the gold one. And you're probably wondering, well, just what the heck is, is, is Zach talking about? So I do have a picture of my car here. There it is. That's uh, that's my nickname is Gold Member. <laughs> Remember Austin Powers, Gold Member, from an unfortunate schmelting accident. So that's the uh, Cayenne GTS manual transmission, one of only um, twenty nine that were sold in Canada. So it's a pretty sweet ride. It is in great shape. So uh, thanks very much to the previous owner who looked after it beautifully. This car was in Edmonton, and I phoned the guy when it was for sale. I said, oh, well, what's the deal with the car? He goes, oh, well, I have a five-car garage, and I have my own wash bay. So he hand-washed the car in his garage once a week. So hats off to him. It's in great shape. <clears throat> i to figure out where it was. And we have over 400 people on board, but only 200 thumbs up. If you guys could smash the thumbs up, that would be greatly appreciated.
I think we have another super chat here, so we'll go down and see that one. Uh, hey, Zach, love your videos and opinion. Is Mazda 3 Turbo Sedan worth it over a base 2 series or an A class? And how does it compete against the GTI WRX? Oh, boy, that's a loaded one. There's a lot to unbox there. Okay, first of all, the Mazda 3 Turbo is a torquey engine. It's quite interesting because it is a engine that has was developed initially for SUVs. So the CX-9, that's a three-row midsize SUV. And it does a great job in that. CX-5 now, it's in there. But when you take that and you put it in a small car, you would think you're going to get this really snappy turbo kind of feel to it. It doesn't exactly deliver that kind of feel. It's more of a almost a bottom-end push. In fact, it reminds me, I know it, is, it doesn't sound like it or anything, but it has some characteristics almost of like a diesel engine. All that great torque. And torque is fantastic. But let's um, let's get your question back up here again, because I want to read it. So that is my best description of the of the turbo engine. Then you add in the fact that Mazda does not have an independent rear suspension in that car. They have what's called a torsion beam rear suspension. So it's a solid axle, and uh, they call it a twist beam or torsion beam. The other vehicles you mentioned have independent rear suspension. So even though Mazda does a good job with this technology, trying to make it as lively as they can, you're still going to go independent rear suspension if you're a sort of a performance kind of driver. So of the ones you mentioned here, um, a base two series, I think you're talking about the Grand Coupe, the, the four-door version, uh, an A-Class, a nice car, 228 horsepower. Uh, I think the base 2 series is the same. Then you've got GTI and WRX. So I haven't driven the new WRX yet, waiting to see uh, get our hands on that. But of the bunch that um, you're listing there, and you look like a young guy, um, I would go GTI. I think the GTI, especially the, the least expensive one, in the Canadian market, I'll, I'll quote Canadian packaging, so you can get a base GTI for around $33,000, and I think it's about $1,500 or $1,200. You can upgrade to get the sunroof and the bigger wheels. That's the one I would get. So you're under $35,000 for more power than uh, all of these except for the WRX. Actually, the Mazda 3 Turbo has more power, but a fantastic car, a really good car. Now, then if you're a manual driver, the GTI is pretty hard to beat. I'm a huge fan of the GTI. It's one of the best cars on the road. Now, I know a lot of people say, oh, but Zach, you know, Volkswagen reliability isn't as good as others. Yeah, but you know what? When you love your car and you think it's fun to drive, go for it. The other thing about the GTI, it runs on regular gas. And we all know the price of gas these days. So uh, that's the one I would buy of, of that bunch for sure. And independent rear suspension. All right. I'm just trying to catch up where I was. Okay. Here's Tom. Why do you call almost all vehicles cars? A four-door sedan is a car. A van is a van. An SUV is not a car. Uh, a truck is not a car. I don't know why. It's just... Why, why do you see a bunch of people together and some are men and some are women and you go, hey guys, I don't know, we just do. I'm not thinking about it that much. My 2022 uh, Santa Fe luxury plug-in hybrid gets 75 miles per gallon. Thanks for the heads up on Hyundai. Well done. So you've got the Santa Fe plug-in hybrid and we're going to be reviewing the Tucson plug-in hybrid this coming Saturday. <clears throat> Um, when even the main lines are out of reach for many new car buyers, where does the auto industry go from here? Yeah, you know what, Ron? I kind of agree with you. Uh, new car prices are really getting up there, like to the point now where I was thinking about this, actually, as I was washing the car. I was thinking about how um, people are being forced because of the prices of vehicles to take on bigger debt and for a longer period of time. So I agree with you. I think that there is... There's a real market, I think, for a brand to come in with a really nice sized 
SUV, for example, a crossover vehicle that is, you know, nicely equipped, but not too expensive. And I think it would sell really well. But I think we're all trying to figure that out. But car companies aren't about giving you the best value. Car companies are, are, are all about getting you to pay more for what you really want. That's why they have packages. <clears throat> oh, you want the bigger screen? You got to pay for that. You want the bigger wheels? You got to pay for that. Oh, you want the sunroof? Got to pay for that. That's the business they're in. They're in the business of getting you to spend more money, not less money. That's why base model cars um, sit. People don't buy them. But I think also the financing has become so creative that people are buying cars over very long periods of time. And often they're what they call upside down in these cars. They end up owing more than the car's ever worth, so which is a real problem. <clears throat> hey, I'm just catching up now. Have you heard of the new Tundra Turbo issue? I hope they get it all sorted out. I don't know. Uh, I haven't heard anything specific. Same thing I just suggested a moment ago. And the reason I bring this up is because I'm a member of the EcoBoost, the Ford F-150 Facebook group. <laughs> Don't ask me how I got there, but I'm a member of that. So you could go to Facebook and you could type in Tundra um, and you'll find a Facebook group that someone started. And there's going to be several of them. You can join all of them and you'll get into the discussion there. So I don't know anything specifically about the turbo issue with the new V6, but there'll be lots of comments there. So Facebook groups have now taken over what the old web forums used to be. So I remember Roadfly, for example, when I owned BMWs, I used to be on that web forum all the time. And then it was Renlist. We've owned a bunch of Porsches. So Renlist is the big one for for Porsches, but the activity on the web forums is really slowed right down. It's all moved over to Facebook and the Facebook groups are really, some of them are quite good. For example, on the Porsche um, Cayenne, I'm a couple of them. Um, if you ask a question on there, there's loads of people with uh, that are mechanics, they're technicians, or they work on the cars themselves and they have a lot of really good information. So if you have a car and you wanna join a group of people who have the same car, most people are on Facebook, Type in the name of the car and you'll see groups and it'll suggest others to you as well. So it's a, it's not a bad way to go. Okay, I am on the barbecue tonight. We are having hamburgers. I'm looking forward to that because as I mentioned, it's a beautiful day. Next Sunday, Super Bowl. No live show. Uh, no bills either in the Super Bowl, but yeah, you can't have everything. So no live show next Sunday. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Uh, Olympics are on as well. So uh, we'll pick this up in two weeks' time. So thanks to everybody that got questions in. I do read them all. If I didn't get yours on, don't worry, I do read them all. Uh, by the way, if you want to send a picture in, Zach at Motormouth.ca, that's Z-A-C-K at Motormouth.ca, or Z-A-C-K at Motormouth.ca if you want to get a picture of your car uh, for the next live show, which will be in two weeks' time. So there you go. I'm going to say good night and... Um, Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Watch the Super Bowl next week, and then we'll see you the following Saturday. Coming up this week, <clears throat> we have the Porsche Macan and the BMW X3 comparison. Then we're doing a top five midsize three-row SUVs. And then on Saturday, it's the Hyundai Tucson PHEV. So we'll, we'll see you online. We'll see you then. Take it easy.